Good morning and a very warm welcome to our webinar on skilled cities in the UK. I'm Jeff Fawcett from Hayes and I'm joined by Alistair Davies from Deloitte. Despite the economic and political backdrop and constant bad PR, the UK is very much open for business. But are you based in the right location? Our webinar today is designed to answer both why the UK out of all the other countries out there is worth investing in, but also if you're already in the UK, how would you consider growing or moving functions of your organization elsewhere? The choice of a location can have far-reaching implications for any business. The right choice can deliver a successful, cost-effective, long-term solution. The wrong choice could impose a burden of increased costs, reduced efficiency, and long-term obligations that may be difficult to mitigate. Getting it right is very complex. There are a myriad of investment and operating variables to consider. What does the country labor force landscape look like? And what's the future pipeline of talent? What kind of office space is available and at what cost? How good is the infrastructure? And what are the transport links like, to name but a few? Deloitte has conducted over 8,000 location-related assignments answering these questions and many more. Support the businesses in finding their best fit. Hayes have supported and in many cases owned the people move element for over 50 organizations in 2017. So to introductions, Alistair is the director in Deloitte's location strategy division. He's a chartered accountant and previously spent two years working offshore where he specialized in financial services. He's also spent a year on secondment to the government, where he worked on the appraisal of funding applications by private sector investing companies. Alistair has more than 20 years' experience working with clients to advise on choice of location decisions. In fact, his first UK client was with Capital One Bank when they first moved to the UK. Alistair works within an international Deloitte location strategy team to help clients make informed location decisions both nationally and internationally. And I'm Jeff Fawcett, I'm Head of Client Engagement for the UK, and typically I get involved with significant projects throughout the UK, be that um, outsourcing solutions for interim or permanent, or indeed relocation projects. Um, recent examples of the work I've been involved with, I've been in, um, involved with outsourcing of temp labor for the construction Kia group, um, and relocation and set up projects for both Lego and Goldman Sachs. Um, Alistair and I have been working together for the last four years, combining our knowledge on behalf of clients, typically looking at relocation. So in terms of agenda for today, um, Alistair will start with a UK and regional analysis overview. Why is the UK still, still very relevant and, and moving that into um, the individual locations? Then you look at the location strategy considerations, how would you approach um, that, sort of, that sort of move? And then finally move on to trends in location strategy. So what are we, what are we, what are we seeing going on out there, um, both um, in the UK and comparative to um, other international sports? I'll then move on to talk about the people element with labor market trends and touch on a couple of case studies where we've supported uh, organizations move um, and then we'll close with solutions um, and potential routes to how you actually make this move, if that's something you wish to undertake. And, and we'll try and close with Q&A. So um, during the, um, the presentation, please feel free to fire questions through and we'll, and we'll try and get through all of them towards the end. Just pass you across to Alistair. Hi, so uh, thanks Jeff and uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. So as Jeff indicated, uh, uh, we get involved in terms of helping companies make location decisions nationally and internationally. But our focus and discussion today is very much around um, the UK and uh, I suppose initially just helping to sort of um, uh, cover off some of the key points which uh, sometimes perhaps get, get, get forgotten in the, um, in the overall excitement of, uh, of markets. So. Uh, Various points I suppose to bring out this stage is not forgetting that um, the UK is the fifth largest uh, trading nation in the world and is the number one inward investment destination in Europe and has been for close to a generation. 
Um, as far as government statistics are concerned, the last uh, published year, there were close to 2,000 discrete uh, investments identified by foreign-owned companies uh, uh, in the UK, um, of which close to a quarter of those were, uh, were, 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 were came from US organizations. When we look at the UK internationally against a whole range of global comp competitiveness factors, the UK scores very heavily and either typically comes out in the first or second quarter across many categories. Um, so some of the areas where it features uh, very highly in terms of top quartile is around um, relatively low levels of government regulation, uh, capacity to attract and retain talent, capacity for innovation, and broadly so quality of, of education. And it's a relatively so low risk, low risk environment. Um, our focus today is on uh, primarily service sector activity, which um, aligns very much to the UK economy, which is typically more than 80% service sector um, dominated. Um, we also view the UK as being really important when we're looking at some of the leading globally ranked universities. So the UK has four of the top 10 globally top-ranked universities um, and nine of the top 50. And uh, that nine should be set in comparison with um, there being just three of the top 50 universities uh, from the rest of, rest of Europe. Um, universities, I'd say, also play a really important role as well in terms of leading edge um, R&D activities. Um, UK universities uh, secure more collaborative EU um, R&D focused funding than those from any other country in Europe. And of course, not forgetting um, the importance of uh, London and the UK as a significant financial services centre. So uh, London is uh, number one globally and the UK is the leading net exporter of financial services. And the impact of London, I think, is really important because that has a whole series of positive knock-on factors which support many other towns and cities um, around, around the UK. So if we just move on and set the scene in some broader uh, location strategy considerations, and the decision to embark upon or consider a new location may be uh, considered uh, based upon a variety of reasons and potentially challenges or opportunities within the business. So we've set out some of those there, and so that may be down to issues around um, suboptimal footprint, issues around or questions around um, talent availability, um, cost or risk, etc. So quite often, I suppose, from our perspective, we see a, an important uh, portion of those projects being, being considered um, either because there are market growth opportunities that companies want to embrace, um, and the question is where do we go to access the talent that we want, um, together with a series of projects there where, where cost is important, where the goal really is to marry up uh, a reduction in cost while seeking to uh, maintain or secure um, an equivalent level of talent base. Uh, and on the right-hand side of this slide, we've given some indication, and clearly those are very high level in terms of the potential uh, impact some of those factors can have in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, supporting um, cost benefits for the business. It's important at the outset to, to set out a series of um, uh, guiding principles to help support um, location strategy. And we set out just some examples of them here. But I'm not necessarily planning to go through and cover each of those um, in turn. But I think there are some important messages I draw out based upon, based upon past experience. Um, and that is around just thinking more logically and strategically longer term for the business in terms not just of 
what is perhaps considered to be in scope for a project at the moment, but perhaps how that scope may be broadened or amended to help achieve greater and broader benefits um, in the business. Um, and perhaps a little bit of a warning as well, based upon some past experience of um, avoiding letting the attraction of incentives or real estate um, drive a location choice. Um, clearly, uh, having, having uh, accessing valuable incentives and real estate uh, can help to boost a project, but that can only be on the basis that the underlying location being considered fulfills the, uh, fulfills the other broader term ambitions of the business and delivers a sustainable longer-term financial benefit. Okay, so um, what has happened in terms of um, investment activity uh, around the UK over the last, over the last uh, year? So within Deloitte, we track um, all announcements by private sector companies on a weekly basis. Um, and draw out details of um, any private sector companies planning to create 50 or more jobs um, in terms of their investment projects. And we've just completed the analysis for, for 2017, and I'm pleased to report that overall um, that represents a total of just over 80,000 jobs planned to be created, um, linked to identified into just more than 400 discrete projects. And when we look at those overall in terms of size, the average number of jobs linked, new jobs linked to each project is 200, which um, I think is a really healthy and positive number in terms of, in terms of investment decisions. We've analyzed the data as well to show the split between uh, those uh, planned investments coming from foreign-owned companies, um, FDI, and indigenous UK businesses, which are colored in orange. Um, over the last five years, the broader trend, I'd say, has generally been upward in terms of total employment uh, uh, planned to be created. And during the course of 2017, although we have seen, uh, I suppose, some slowdown in activity from the first quarter, um, the level of uh, investment by foreign-owned companies in the UK has continued um, to represent a strong and important uh, portion of overall investment activity. Uh, so if we move on from the high-level detail to perhaps help it illustrate uh, what are some of the larger project announcements made during 2017. So these five projects alone represent something like 15% of planned investment activity announced during the course of 2017. We have, a, I think, a pretty good mix in terms of range of activities. So uh, the largest single project in, announced in the year was with um, Dyson in terms of uh, expansion of their wheelchair-based operation, looking to create another Three and a half thousand people over the next uh, over the next couple of years, and the Dyson one I think is an interesting one because 2017 for them also um, launched uh, their first year of um, undergraduates. So um, Dyson um, are now awarding degrees. So um, their first program I think of just under so 50 50 students. Um, work several days a week uh, on site involved in doing R&D and, uh, and two days a week in, uh, in Warwick University. So uh, after Dyson, we have major investments announced by um, Amazon looking to create um, 2,500 jobs in the Northwest, by Vodafone with a range of customer service project announcements uh, at multiple sites around the UK. Um, uh, close to 1,800 jobs planned by uh, Jet2, linked into growth of um, travel and leisure. An important project by Barclays, planning to create 1,750 IT jobs uh, across a number of locations in the UK. And one of the sort of the key messages I draw out from that is that you know these are significant projects, but um, they involve a good mix of skills, and um, some of the larger ones then, in particular, I suppose, involve uh, more highly skilled, um, you know, engineering and IT-related roles. So 
um, great um, value added and, uh, and, and well-paid well -paid, well -paid salaries. If we uh, consider for a second then what um, else has happened in terms of the breakdown of investment by foreign-owned companies in the UK. So out of the total projects of 400, we've captured uh, 114 projects uh, by foreign-owned companies in the UK in the course of the year, plan to create just over 25,000 jobs. Um, we've split those by the geographical origin of, of the companies, and uh, you will see from that that North America represents just over 50% of all activity in the year, with one company alone, um, Amazon, representing or being responsible for seven projects, planning to create almost 6,500 jobs, and that involves a mix of um, large distribution facilities uh, but also investment, uh, two investments as well in terms of um, IT-related uh, activities based in the in the southeast. Uh, Europe comes second place with close to 35%, and uh, and, and followed uh, by uh, Asia with uh, with 13%. So let's look more closely to home then in terms of how the, the split works out by region, and the ranking we have there is based. Uh, purely on the planned announced um, job growth job growth numbers. So in twenty seventeen the top three regions were Southwest, Northwest and East Midlands. Um, the Southwest uh, uh, position as number one in the period was very positively enhanced by the uh, the announcement of of Dyson, which clearly had a significant impact on the overall numbers. Um, Clearly, the, the activity of the regions uh, varies by year, depending um, on activity. Um, one point I would draw out is in terms of southeast, which is traditionally always clearly going to be a very important um, a region in terms of investment activity. Um, last year, the region was number one, uh, impacted very heavily by some significant uh, project announcements by Google, Facebook, um, and others plan to create several thousand jobs um, in the region. Um, the Southeast continues um, to remain a, a really important region for the UK. Um, and undoubtedly, I suppose, so fairly, fairly put, is, um, is going to be the region, and London in particular, with probably the potentially some of the, the deepest and most varied um, talent pools. But those clearly come at, at a cost. And uh, a lot of um, organisations will ultimately sort of look at a at a, having a sort of a diversified sort of portfolio of locations, which um, will have operations in London, the South East, benefiting from from that stronger skill pool, but also potentially looking at other regions as well, which can benefit from uh, potentially sort of lower cost, which might prove to be at longer term sustainable um, locations where there may be um, lower levels of, of staff attrition. And since our focus today is very much around the service sector, um, we've drawn together and highlighted, uh, again, in, in, in order of planned um, job creation projects, um, uh, top three regions across a number of those sectors. So I think an important message to draw out from that is that is that um, the leading sectors um, vary quite widely um, depending on uh, on the individual sort of sector themselves. But perhaps if I just draw out for you today, just briefly, perhaps some of the some of the companies then which have sort of uh, had a big impact in the year. So on the business services side, there's projects by Vodafone, BT, and the likes of First Solutions, which have impacted those. And on the ICT side with Barclays, um, Head Group, and Facebook, which have also um, played an important, uh, important role. So uh, at this stage, let me, let me hand over to Jeff to talk more about um, labor market trends. Jeff. Thank you, Alistair. So the people elements um, of this, I just wanted to initially highlight a survey that we've recently conducted where we had uh, 18,000 respondents, both um, employers and employees, and I think it gives us a good um, backdrop to see what the mood is across um, across the UK. 
Um, I think underlyingly there's still um, what we can see from an employer perspective is there's a real drive to continue to grow um, and expand businesses. We mentioned here 59% um, are unfortunately looking at skill shortages, which is impacting pro productivity. Um, but behind that, there's a real desire to try and get the right skill sets. Although I do feel what we felt from a lot of the employee responses was that there was a lot of pressure, a lot of downward pressure on employees and organizations. As many organizations were facing this uh, productivity challenge, um, perhaps largely due to the, um, the underlying economic challenges. Um, so our overall feeling was that you know, employee satisfaction isn't, you know, isn't that high um, as 50% of the employees feel that they didn't have a lot of um, uh, progression um, within their organization. And um, indeed, 44% of them said their, their work-life balance was, um, was, was poor. And I think, again, that's probably due to you know, more pressure coming from ultimately above as productivity levels are, are lower. And I think um, you know, whilst that's a, that is a challenge that I think probably a lot of people are aware of, I think what that means is that if you are able to open um, you know, a new vibrant site or have a new vibrant offering, um, you will be in a position to you know, attract good people um, because of the overall, the overall mood in the camp. So I just wanted to you know, start with that, which is very much a you know, UK backdrop and, you know, and across, across really all, all, all sectors, but I think it's, you know, it, is, it is very true. Um, so let's look at which, which areas we see typically moving, um, and this by no means covers all, but I think you know, a lot of the, a lot of the um, client requests we have will, and Deloitte will have, will typically cover these three areas, or one of these areas, or a, or, or a combination, but we often see um, you know, finance moving, and I think it's, you know, it's no longer the preserve of being a, moving a purchase ledger or accounts payable function. Um, with technology, again, it's, it's not just about support functions, um, you know, in there. I think people are moving, um, you know, deeper, more business critical areas of technology, but they've got to do that very cautiously. Um, and the third area is, is, you know, is contact centers. I think there's a lot of movement in, in that market. We're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing a really sort of renewed investment there in contact centers as, as, as I guess, customer services, uh, or sorry, um, uh, customers' expectations are, are changing. So they're the, they're the three broad areas. And I think I just wanted to flag them over the next, the next three slides because I think there's very different challenges in there um, that, are worth, that are worth calling out. So if we look at, if we look at finance there, there still is a national shortage of newly qualified accountants, um, and I, I both mean from a from a chart accountancy perspective and um, and, a, and a CMIT perspective. Um, there's what we're seeing is there's a there's a really sort of strong demand in 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 the significant shared service centres in in the northwest. Um, but what I would say within finance is that there's probably less accountants looking to move than the than the average that we surveyed. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps you may say, as a as a as a sector or as a breed, um, they're perhaps not as um, not not as big a risk takers. Um, but I think the underlying feel that we got from the surveys is that they feel that their work life balance is better, um, and they feel generally in quite a positive mood. So, you know, what does that mean if you're if you're looking to re relocate your finance department? Well, you know, frankly, the proposition needs to be, you know, very very positive. Um, there needs to be a strong career roadmap in there as well um, for you, for in order for you to hire the, to, to, you know, to bring the, to, to bring the best talent through. So let's move on to technology. And I think, you know, during our our, our survey, it's, you know, it's no surprise. There's a there's a huge skills shortage in this area. It's the it's the most prolific area at, at, at present, um, and a lot of the business leaders were commenting on the, the hiring challenge they got they have are really bringing back their their business growth you know growth is 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 often driven via um, via their position uh, from a, from a from a tech perspective um, we're seeing in here huge salary increases far higher than the mean across the market um, and really it's you know it's entirely linked to the levels of 
huge demand in there, which are really being driven by you know, three pillars as we see it, um, clear digital transformation, um, cyber security, and obviously the, the levels of reg changes that are, that are, that are going on as well. 65% um, of our clients are saying they're already growing their somewhat significant um, tech teams um, continually, and many of our clients, um, often with our support, are actually looking are looking overseas because the skills shortage is that you know is that vast. Um, so again, you know, what what do you need to do if you're thinking I'm moving a um, our technology department or a part of a technology department elsewhere? Well, you know, things like flexible working is a is a is a huge draw in this sector. Um, you know, 73% of the people that we had um, respond regarded this as the absolute key benefit. Um, and then clearly things like Employer branding is, is, is key, um, and in that context, it's a, again around remote working, it's around having cutting edge equipment, um, having forms of sponsorship whereby um, the tech experts feel they're, 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 co they're competing with the best, um, and around having tech blogs. I don't think it's anything of the, of the reserve in the past where you've been you know, hiring there's all things like you know, bringing in things like ping pong tables makes makes a big difference anymore. I think the landscape's you know very much very much changing. So you know technology and finance there you know very different. So you may be thinking I'm going to move our tech and finance and customer customer services, but I think you need to consider the the nuances in there in terms of how you approach that market and what the employer branding needs to be to to attract that talent. So the final area, contact centers um, or customer services, and I think you know one thing that you know Deloitte and I would both agree when we work together on these sorts of things is there's often a, a general sort of limited challenge in any part of the country to you know to hire for hire into these into these roles. Um, that said, there's probably a couple of areas that you should consider if if the roles are largely outbound. Again, it's it's, it's quite different than being inbound inbound, and there's more of a challenge there. And I also think if you are looking at, um, you know, your operatives being multilingual, that's a, a, a very different dynamic. Um, we recently helped uh, an organisation set up a shared service centre, um, and the requirements were multilingual Nordics. And and actually, when you when you when you dial into it, there's only a few, there's only a, a very few locations in the UK that could that could cope with that so you need to you need to consider that uh, very very carefully um, it's clearly an area with you know typically a lot of a lot of movement and a high level of high level of attrition um, and I think the, the you know the, the value proposition needs to focus on the environments people are working in and not significant but small tweaks to salary you can you can you can get movement and you can get some good talent moving moving to you um, from comparator organizations I think we've seen some hiring challenges in the northwestern Scotland whereby the market I wouldn't say was was completely overheated or saturated but there's high demand in in, in those areas um, and as I've said before I do think there's a there's a renewed investment in contact centers in the in, in the UK um, as, as the you know there's been a major changing of a, a customer service expectation um, interestingly we've just helped a major um, a major bank set up a contact center actually in central London for some specific needs so you know it wasn't all about cost it's about the you know it's about the customer proposition um, and the final point I would flag is is it's absolutely pivotal and critical to make sure you've got your leadership team um, correctly in, in, in place there. You know, can you re relocate them from a current site, or do you have to go out to the market to get the you know, to get the best talent there? So there, so there are the three areas that I want to call out. As I say, all 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 different, and um, that needs some strong consideration. So what are the other the few pointers that I think you should consider? Well, firstly, I think when you're setting out on a project like this, you should be looking at attrition levels. Um, I think quite commonly a reason perhaps for move, one of the reasons for moving is that attrition levels in a certain location, perhaps in, the, in London or the southeast, are, are, indeed, are indeed too high. And I think there's some, there's some obvious benefits of being somewhere in, in whereby you are a, a strong player in that market and perhaps a top three employer in, in an area. Um, and there's some huge benefits from that. 
However, you know, I do talk to customers where they complain to me that their attrition levels, bizarrely, are, are too low because they're in an environment where they are the, the top employer in the area and they feel that actually some of their great talent coming through are often stifled because nobody's move, moving on. So I think you know, one of the advice points is to, is to set the bar and set the standard and think, well, what are we trying to achieve from, a, um, from various different factors, but attrition levels is, is, is one of them. Um, the second point is Brexit, which you'd be pleased to know I'm not going to talk about because I'm sure you've all um, had days and days of talk around Brexit. But I think the key point I would flag there is clearly if you're in a sector that is potentially significantly impacted or has a high level of migrant workforce, um, that, is, that is something to look into with a very, very deep, you know, deep lens. Um, I don't think it's perhaps something that is at this point significant across uh, business professional services. Um, but clearly, there are areas in hospitality, catering, and the like that have that probably have more of a more of an impact in terms of sustainability of em employment models. So I think if you're in those sectors, um, some deep research or predictive research needs um, needs needs doing. And the third point, if possible, <laughs> is I would say get the, you know try and you know try and get um, the crystal ball out if that's if that's possible. It's we've seen in the past where an organisation has moved to an area and has been very dominant or a significant player in the area, um, and has invested in moving into into that area and spent time and money moving there. Um, and then once they've started gaining the benefits of it, um, some of their competitors then move into their area and become somewhere that can take, you know, take staff from there. So I think you know, one pointer would be that versus London, whereby uh, the dominance of any, any particular company is, 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 is relatively minimal, in certain locations you can become top dominant and almost a bit of a, a, bit of a target, and the landscape does change over a period of time. We certainly noticed this within the within the banking sector, perhaps in the northwest. Um, you know, one moved and then others followed, and that creates a very different a very different land, landscape. So, in terms of actually moving, what are the five things we typically do on, on behalf of our customers and work with with Deloitte on? Well, firstly, we look at the cost. Um, we're very conscious a lot of the moves at the moment are for or involve cost gains. Um, you know, what are the differences between the, what you're paying for your current staff um, and versus being, being elsewhere, and often that can be very, very significant. Um, the second point is around availability in, in, different, in different spots, as I mentioned earlier, something like contact center versus certain areas of tech, very, very different. So what's the availability like? And also, notably, what's the availability like at different volumes? So, if you were to say to us, can can we can you hire five newly qualified accountants in Newcastle easily? Um, uh, well, that's very possible. But if you want to hire 250, that's a you know it's a, that's a very very different different story. So, what we typically do is provide a almost a, a traffic light system response to um, diff different volumes. Um, point three and point four are very much interlinked. It's looking um, at a very in a very close lens at the other organizations in that area and comparable organizations. And when I say comparable organizations, don't just think same industry. I think particularly in, in, in tech, it's thinking about who are the, the marquee employers in that area. And I think you really need to look at them through the lens of, um, are they a threat competitor? So if you move into that area, will they take your staff? Um, and then on the flip side, um, you know who are the who are the organisations that are what I would call talent competitors, where you can take people from, um, and there's a very fine sort of seesaw balance between three and four because you know in a way you need you, you need you need both. Um, and the final point I would suggest is once you've perhaps done a lot of due diligence and you're you're convinced of perhaps two or three different cities, go and go out and actually um, be there, look, touch, feel them, understand the different. Uh, sides of the city, the different road links. Um, we commonly introduce uh, organisations to our um, local offices at that point, and I don't think you can ever, ever be actually be in there to get the to get the proper the proper look and feel of that. I'm now just going to move on to a couple of um, case studies, which I think draw out some of the um, perhaps lessons learned from it. 
Um, and the first one was a, a project we ran in Q3, Q4 last year on behalf of a, a music licensing business. Um, their challenge was um, they're effectively a, a joint venture uh, that was starting up in, um, in Leicester and they needed over 200 um, staff, largely call center, but also a mix of corporate functions, um, IT, finance, and I think um, the challenges they faced, they didn't actually know originally, originally where to go. Um, so, you know, they did, a lot, they did a lot of work around choosing, choosing the individual, individual city. Um, they didn't have an ability to manage any of their recruitment and didn't really know about anything about the, you know, the local candidate pools or, 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 or pay rates. Um, significantly, they also didn't have a, a, a senior management community in place to, to do this for them. Um, our solution was we deployed a, a, an on off site um, team um, who ran a series of assessment centers um, and we deployed some technology to see where we were getting the sources of people from and I think a big part of this was creating the the market the employer value proposition uh, whilst we were doing that. I think the result of it was a, a significant cost save versus many of the other locations that could have set up in um, and and realistically, there was a, a you know a very strong depth of, of, of quality because they became across as a, a marquee brand doing you know doing the, doing the right thing. Um, the second one I would cite would, would be a, a global toy manufacturer. Now, interestingly, this probably bucks the trend. They they actually moved to London. So I think the point I'm almost calling out here is cost is is, is always relevant but it's not usually the the ultimate the ultimate key driver in, in many instances um, the challenge here was to set up a, a, a new global hope of 120 heads in London um, it has, it's actually subsequently grown to in excess of two, 200 but what they were looking at was a was a uh, was top tier talent quite senior uh, across many different forms of corporate functions heavily into marketing and, and, and IT um, I think the challenges here was actually a, it was a cost increase for them. Um, they're a, a very well-known brand, so it was making sure the employer value proposition was 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 correct, um, and they wanted to find the best talent in um, in in the market. Again, in this instance, we deployed a, an on-site team who were very much immersed into the business and were able to um, best represent their um, their their employer brand. And I think, as I say, I think that the, the lessons we've learned from it is, is it's, in that instance, it wasn't about cost. It was actually about skill set um, being at a certain level, and it was it was also significantly about um, positioning the the employer value proposition at the right uh, at the right at the right point. Alistair, I'll just pass back across to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. So let us try and be uh, be. Um, practical here and I suppose to help set out um, some thoughts there about how to plan um, effectively in terms of uh, in terms of location strategy. To set out some of the key areas here and I suppose I just have draw out some of those uh, to uh, to expand and explore for you today. Uh, by all means, the, the most important one there is being clear from the outset about what the uh, project objectives and the scope are. So defining what those drivers are. So is the project driven by, by cost, by a search for talent, uh, accessing new markets, um, et cetera? So um, what does the project actually want to do and achieve? Um, uh, and also what perhaps are going to be perhaps some of the um, additional parts of the business there which might also want to co-locate with it or ultimately may wish to migrate there over a period of time so that the um, any assessment done of locations is based upon what that medium to long-term goal is going to look like rather than a short-term requirement uh, because clearly a location which might be fine for a small and a modest project may prove to be particularly challenging for a project that ultimately ends up being twice twice the size. Also really important to set now what those critical location success factors are. Um, they will vary by company and by project, but typically they will fall within some of the broader categories around 
uh, human resources, infrastructure, risk, um, operational environment, and perhaps uh, around incentives. And if we're thinking about the human resources piece for a beginning, that, that will tap into and potentially serve access and look to evaluate information around the size of the workforce, the composition of that workforce, the, the size of that talent pool for what the client is looking to achieve, um, but also, depending upon the roles as well, looking at um, what that pipeline of future talent might look like, potentially linked into universities or colleges, et cetera, um, understanding what that throughput of talent is going to be and the level of competition which might exist for it. Then it's around thinking about what the search area should be. Um, so that search area should perhaps be more broadly defined in the first instance so that a good mix of locations can be um, evaluated and considered and that no potentially um, interesting and exciting locations are um, removed early on in that process, uh, thereby potentially sort of losing out on some of the, some of the big prices. Uh, Ultimately, it's really important that the project is planned very carefully in terms of timeline because quite often the question around where a project is based is something that people are doing or looking after um, over and above their, their day job. So it is important to have a, a clear timetable in place um, to keep to that in terms of uh, but allowing the appropriate time there in terms of preparing, searching and analyzing and evidencing so that informed decisions can be made. And one final really important point I bring out there is around determining whether the project is confidential. Um, decisions around where and what uh, happens in terms of a business um, can be very um, emotive. Um, and a point perhaps to reflect is that if you, in the course of um, your uh, evaluation project, um, you were to read in the press information uh, which has been revealed on the project, uh, what impact that might have on, on headcount, on existing staff. Uh, and that clearly can be a challenge um, if the project being considered is one that involves uh, moving to a different location or potentially involves a reduction in headcount. So an area there which is potentially so really important in the business and needs to be considered very carefully. Okay, and again, based upon um, projects that we've um, you know, heard of or seen over a period of time, what are some of the mistakes and the things that um, can go wrong if that project hasn't effectively been planned and analyzed, um, analyzed up front? So, so again, we've, we, we've drawn out some of those here to give you a flavor. I've touched on one or two of them earlier. So for example, the questions around narrowing the search area rapidly. Um, quite often a, uh, uh, a focus might be on perhaps one or two locations, which may be based upon some personal preferences um, rather than perhaps doing a broader objective analysis. Um, quite often uh, focusing on a small number of locations too early in that process ends up being counterproductive because um, as projects are discussed internally, so questions get raised about why other regions or key locations weren't considered and potentially additional time and, and effort is spent in terms of going back and researching that data. So as I said from the outset, it's important perhaps to consider a, a broad search area in the first place uh, linked to the broader objectives of the project and narrow those down um, by a filtered approach so that um, a smaller number of contender locations can emerge. And really important as part of that analysis there is, is uh, making sure that proper research is done in terms of community trends. So for example, a key part there is around understanding uh, what is happening in the chosen location um, with other companies. So which other companies either um, have announced in the recent past or are poised to announce now, which may ultimately be also competing for that same pool of labor. Or sometimes the converse occurs, whereby uh, existing companies may be um, downsizing or, 
or moving out for completely other reasons, which may provide a great opportunity in terms of um, accessing talent. So, a, a couple of sort of pointers there today, which uh, we hope help to sort of set the scene. Okay. And overall, I suppose, from a, um, a Deloitte perspective, is when we are helping companies go through and make informed location strategy um, decisions, we use a, a phased approach um, by this, um, initially going quite broad in terms of confirming um, you know, stakeholder leadership engagement, what are the specifications, the key factors which drive it, uh, helping to narrow down uh, location there to some serious contenders. And then using that filtered approach, initially desk-based, and then visits to locations and sites then in terms of helping to evaluate and justify uh, the evidence base. Um, and that evidence base is uh, typically going to be strengthened by meeting with uh, local town or city officials, um, meeting with other companies, universities, um, meeting with the likes of um, Hayes in terms of the local people on the ground who understand the dynamics of that marketplace. But ultimately, uh, an informed decision can be made based upon the facts. Um, and ultimately, clearly, the goal of the work that we get involved in is making sure that our clients, clients end up in the right location for the right reasons, uh, and those locations um, are going to be sustainable over the medium to longer term. So from a Hayes perspective, uh, which part of our business gets involved? Um, it's our division, Hayes Town Solutions, uh, where we say we typically um, look after recruitment process, outsourcing, uh, or managed service providers, uh, so permal, permal temp. Um, and we also uh, support a number of our clients in their, you know, in, their, in their moving. I think the one thing that I would, I would cite is, is you know, every every challenge is is is, is different um, in terms of um, the solution there, and they're all and they're all uh, typically tailored in terms of our support our support to that. Um, so um, I think we're probably about ten minutes from or twelve minutes from close. So if we move to um, questions, um, which I'm just looking what we currently have, but also if you have any questions at this point, please do. Um, throw them across to both Alistair and I. Okay, so um, I've got one here, and I think this one's probably for Alistair, sorry. Um, what impact do you think that planned rail infrastructure, Crossrail and HS2, will have on choice of location? Okay, so I think this is a, a really interesting and important feature. So we are looking at um, some investments there, which are clearly significant in terms of in terms of cost. Um, we are reaching a situation soon where um, Crossrail, which is going um, east to west around around um, London, um, uh, provides some um, broader benefits. So I suppose what we are seeing there is the improved rail infrastructure um, has already, I suppose, resulted in an increase in in cost of um, property um, east to west, um, and uh, also, I suppose, has made it um, easier there for people who are um, living um, further afield um, to be able to um, get into the, the heart of the city. So that's a positive. I think over the medium to longer term with high speed two, that is going to be a longer term initiative, but I think, again, the, the fact that there's going to be more, um, more important and sort of strategic investment there, um, improving um, connectivity there between, the, um, between key cities um, is undoubtedly going to make it um, easier for um, labor to move, for people to potentially consider jo locations for jobs there which are, which are further afield. Uh, and hence, so it, hence, I suppose, have happened to ultimately sort of shrink part of the UK in terms of uh, um, ability and speed to, uh, to move around. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I've got a couple of, uh, of B-word questions, apologies, Brexit word, um, which I might try and combine. Um, 
We've got two here. What impact might Brexit have on service sector jobs? Um, and also, we've got a what is the multilingual skill landscape across the UK? Uh, do you foresee any challenges challenge in attracting pan EU language skills in wake of Brexit? Difficult one, ones. Um, I think I think to answer that, I think um, what we've seen with multilingual roles in the past is that we very much have to understand the language requirements first, and then and then go across the UK. I don't think we've got a um, you know a precise a precise map that um, that dials that, that dials them all through. Um, but I think what we often find is, is um, I've referenced Nordics before, which is a which is often a big challenge and needs to be in certain in certain spots. Um, I don't think at this point we foresee um, significant impact of that um, in in relation to Brexit. I think a lot of the communities are are in those market in in the required language skills are often quite long established um, long established uh, communities. Um, so I don't think there'll be a significant uh, impact around that. Um, in relation to the impact of Brexit having on having on um, having on service sector jobs, I mean, as I said before, I think you know where we, where we're starting to see the impacts and starting to see significant cost increases and hiring challenges seems to be um, you know perhaps in the in the in, you know in the in perhaps your sort of construction catering type sectors at at present. Um, but I think it very much is something that we're starting to hear a lot more noise on over the last three months, and I think that will, you know, I think that will um, accelerate. Um, as I said before, you know, we're looking at some pro well, we're looking at a, a, a significant um, project for a service provider at the moment, and it's a three-year project for them, and we are, um, you know, working uh, strongly to try and ascertain where the talent pools will be at in, you know, two, three years' time. So it's. Um, it's it's uh, we we can't give the exact science on that or the exact answer on that as yet, um, but it's something that needs um, significant thought on if if you are in certain in certain sectors. I think there's a, a point I'd add as well because there's been a recent um, uh, Deloitte survey and uh, I think it's called um, Power App, which has involved um, a, a survey of um, of EU nationals in the UK, and I suppose one of the Messages which has come out of that that as a result of um, of um, Brexit, there's potentially an increased um, um, risk there of EU nationals, I suppose, especially those who have higher levels of, um, of of skills and qualifications, potentially considering um, locations other than the UK, um, which they, uh, they they may be more inclined to migrate to over a period of time. So. Um, uh, but clearly, so early days this stage, and hopefully over the next couple of months, as the um, as the position on Brexit becomes clearer, um, people are then going to be in a better position to make um, make, make make informed decisions. Um, I've got two I've got two great questions here. Um, how quickly can you do an assessment and find staff? Um, and the second one is how can I engage Hayes and Deloitte to help support me in getting the necessary data together to make the right decisions? On which is the most suitable location for 200 staff? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can ring us. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay, so, so I suppose actually giving the sort of an idea in terms of sort of um, um, timing of that. I suppose um, once I've uh, uh, just gone through, as we said earlier, about what those you know those sort of critical factors are, and looking in particular at the type of roles and skills you're looking at, both in terms of perhaps some of those volume roles and perhaps um, identified sort of hard to fill roles. Um, an exercise there in terms of um, you know gathering some of that data and doing the analysis there. Um, it's probably something that is something like a, a six to eight week type of program um, in terms of uh, in terms of gathering and gathering the data assimilating that and presenting that back. But uh, you know, clearly that varies, but that's perhaps hopefully a, uh, a, a quick indication at this stage. Yeah, I think, uh, I think to follow that in terms, of, in terms of, of, of staffing teams up, it's probably a similar sort of time frame, time frame on top um, from, you know, from agreement, but depends on obviously volumes, uh, 
and challenge of talent pools and and, and really the assessment uh, the assessment process um, that we uh, that we design on behalf of our of our customers. Um, Another great question here, uh, could offering remote working be an alternative and a lower cost solution to office relocation? Um, I'll, just, I'll just start with that one. I think um, ab absolutely we're seeing a lot more of it. Um, I think the challenge I often get on that front is that there's many organizations from a management perspective who are unable to manage uh, remote working well, and I think that and I think that holds it. I think often that holds it back more significantly than than anything else. Yeah. I think in, uh, in 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 the market we're actually in, um, uh, agility is highlighted as being a really important uh, factor uh, in terms of uh, in terms of employee satisfaction and providing um, flexibility there for people. To work remotely rather than being being forced or encouraged to go to a to a defined office or base um, uh, definitely helps in terms of employee employee attraction. Um, undoubtedly, um, that that option there can help in terms ultimately, I suppose, of um, potentially reducing the need for a relocation or potentially reducing the level of the amount of space which is required. To support those um, those operations. So, even when I think about it from an internal perspective in our business, that um, each day there's a there's a check done on on desk occupancy in offices, so that we know how much capacity we have and uh, and helping helps very much to uh, uh, design and design and decide um, what that uh, office footprint of the future looks like in terms of space. Thank you, Master. I think um, I think we're probably at a time point um, there. So what we'll what we'll do is a, there's a few more questions that we haven't uh, that we haven't answered. So we'll collect a, a, a Q and A and and pull that together in in the responses that we're sending uh, that we're, or, or the follow up that we'll send back round to you um, together with um, the copy of the or recording of the of the webinar. Um, so thank you for on behalf of Alistair and I. Thank you for joining today. Um, a couple of additional additional points just to leave you with. If you if you would like to get a copy of the um, Skill Cities report, which is a 50-page document which outlines um, um, a number of cities in the in the UK um, and some further points in there, please do drop us a um, please do drop us a note. Um, and in addition, as well, if you have um, if you have a, a need for assessing that your uh, candidate experience in terms of um, what your employee value proposition looks like, uh, please uh, complete the survey here. But we'll send uh, we'll send those notes around to you. Thanks for your time and joining us today. Um, I wish you a good day.